happen. So um, great to see everyone here. Thanks for all the judges and the competitors. Um, my name is Bill Gates. Uh, I'm the vice chairman of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors and thrilled to be moderating the semifinals. We started at uh, about eight o'clock this morning with many, many teams, and now we're down to just four. So first of all, congratulations to these two teams for making it this far in the competition. Uh, I think I speak on behalf of all the judges in saying that uh, you have really made, it's been quite an accomplishment to get to this level because the uh, competition has been very, very stiff so far today. Um, uh, so now uh, we are moving into the semifinal round, and uh, this is, uh, again, an Oxford debate. And I think at this point, uh, everyone has gotten very familiar uh, with that type of debate, but we'll just cover that real briefly. Uh, again, the focus of this Oxford debate will be on a topic related to free speech. The prompt uh, that we will be using for the semifinal round is the following. Students or faculty members who make other students feel threatened or unsafe should face disciplinary hearings. All right, so we're gonna go through the phases of the debate real, real quickly. I'll kind of describe those and then we will go into the introduction of the judges. There are three rounds in the style of debate. Uh, the first round, we will be going through the opening statements uh, presented by one student from each side the affirmative and the negative teams. Uh, then in the second round, we will engage in cross-examination. Uh, both the competitors will have the opportunity to cross-examine one another. I may ask some questions of both sides as well. I would uh, welcome uh, the judges to uh, add any additional questions that they would like to have answered. If they could just put those in the chat and then we will go through as many of those as we are able to before the completion of the cross-examination portion uh, of, the, uh, of the debate. Finally, in the final round, uh, one competitor from each side will have the opportunity to kind of sum up uh, all that has gone on and give a closing, uh, closing statement. At the conclusion of the round, our judges who have been trained uh, in how to score Oxford debate, and I think at this point, maybe all of them have already uh, scored uh, multiple Oxford debates, uh, we will do that. Then we will post the results of this round about 30 minutes uh, after the completion of the round, and those, you can find those on the Regents Cup uh, webpage, regentscup2021.azregents.edu. Uh, now I'm honored uh, to have the opportunity to introduce our judges. Uh, we have with us uh, today um, Anne Mariucci. Uh, she is a former regent, a member of the Board of Regents. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as well, we have Sean Bienberg, and uh, this is Professor uh, Bienberg. He's an assistant professor with the ASU School of Civic and Economic Thought and leadership. Uh, we also have Mike Carney with us today. Mr. Carney is the Senior Vice President of Emerging Issues with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Uh, and then we have Molly Green, who is the Senior Director of Arizona Government Relations and Public Policy with Salt River Project. And uh, finally, uh, we have Keith Allred, who's the executive director of the National Institute of, uh, for Civil Discourse. So again, welcome to all of our judges and thank you to all of our judges. We really appreciate you taking this time out of your Saturday uh, to, to be a part of this. Uh, and uh, as well, uh, I would like to say to the coaches of the two teams, congratulations to your coaches on uh, the success of your teams and making it uh, to this point in the tournament. Uh, finally, uh, before we get going here, I wanna make sure that the competitors know that I will be timing and that as we get to that one minute point, I will you know, hold up a finger so you know that you have one minute left. Uh, we do have the opening statements run six to seven minutes in length. So once we hit that six minute cutoff, I will raise, raise the, the one minute sign. Uh, and then the cross-examinations, 
uh, I'll, I'll ask the last question or I'll, I'll have you guys do the last question about 22 minutes into that. And again, closing statements are about four to five minutes. So when we're about four minutes into it, again, I will raise uh, the finger. So with that, unless we have any questions, either from the competitors or the judges, we will move into the opening statements and I will turn to the affirmative. Perfect. And before I start, I'd just like to briefly extend our gratitude to our moderator and our judges and to our opponents. So let's get the show on the road. Is anyone not ready? Perfect. Jake and I affirm the resolution resolved students or faculty members who make other students feel threatened or unsafe should face disciplinary hearings. Of course, we acknowledge that there have been instances of misconduct or failures on behalf of university's disciplinary hearing procedures, but we argue that on balance, disciplinary hearings are good because they are required by due process and they act as a site that protects the well-being of students and faculty. We think that the specific grievances that the negative team is likely to identify are evidence that colleges and universities should strive to iteratively improve their disciplinary hearing procedures so as to best protect the due process each and every student and faculty is due. In the absence of disciplinary hearings, universities would be able to discipline and punish students and faculty on a whim without any substantive attention to either the victim or the accused rights of due process. Despite their likely condemnations of effective disciplinary hearings, the negative team forecloses any possible means of enforcing a school's code of conduct for both students and faculty. Because Jake and I affirm today's resolution as a general principle, this means that the negative team will need to refuse disciplinary hearings also as a general principle and not propose alternative solutions. You should prefer this interpretation of the resolution because it would be unreasonable to expect us as the affirmative to defend every single college and university's unique disciplinary hearing procedures and would allow the other team to cherry pick alternative solutions. Allow us to forward the following definitions of disciplinary hearings. When a college or university student or faculty is charged with a crime or other violation of a school's policy, the academic institution will initiate disciplinary hearings to determine whether a violation took place and, if so, the appropriate punishment. Our first contention is due process. Due process requires that a university provide disciplinary hearings. The Foundation for Individual Rights in Education states, potential adverse consequences of a university disciplinary proceedings against an accused student's liberty and property interests in their education renders such proceedings subject to the requirements of due process. Due process is not a fixed or rigid concept, but rather is a flexible standard which varies. Determining what process is due in a university disciplinary proceeding necessitates the examination of one, the private interest, two, the risk of erroneous deprivation of such interest, and three, the school's interests, including the function involved in the fiscal and administrative burden. Protection of due process via disciplinary hearings provides students and faculty adequate hearing notice, impartiality in the hearing process, rights to counsel, rights to present evidence, etc. In the absence of disciplinary hearings, every student and faculty member risks being deprived of those rights along with their life, liberty, or property without due process. Colleges and universities have an interest at stake in disciplinary hearings because discipline and order are essential to the educational system's functioning. There are always the private interests at stake in that the accused student has liberty and property interests in their education. Disciplinary hearings are necessary to protect the interests of students in completing their educations, as well as avoiding unfair or mistaken exclusion from the educational environment. Our second contention is protecting the protection of students and faculty's rights and well-being. We will be using ASU's Code of Ethics for faculty and student code of conduct as exemplars of a majority of other colleges and universities' own school policies, but we acknowledge the differences between them. ASU Code of Ethics for faculty prohibits the following acts. Discrimination against a student on political grounds or for reasons of race, religion, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, national origin, disability, veteran status, or other arbitrary or personal reasons, and use of the position of power to coerce the judgment or conscience of a student and to cause harm to a student for arbitrary or personal reasons, and participating in, in the intimidation in the classroom and harassment. Under the ASU Student Code of Conduct, the following are identified as prohibited conduct for students. One, all forms of student academic dishonesty and plagiarism. Two, endangering, threatening, or causing physical harm to any member of the university community or to oneself. Three, impersonation of another. Four, 
initiating, causing, or contributing to any false report, warning, or threat of fire, explosion, or other emergency. Five, engaging in, supporting, promoting, or sponsoring hazing. Six, stalking. Seven, engaging in discriminatory activities. And eight, sexual misconduct. Now, this list wasn't provided for no reason whatsoever, and there are two impacts. First, we think that each example provided should seem, be seen as an advantage to having disciplinary hearings because many of these examples of unacceptable conduct are only punishable at the university level because many cases don't arise to the level of a violation of federal or state law. Second, this also proves that disciplinary hearings for students or faculty make other students feel unsafe or threatened does not silence voices, as the negative may tell you, but instead actively protects students' voices from discrimination no matter their political view. Take the following instance, in which an Iowa State English professor forbid papers, quote, against gay marriage, abortion, Black Lives Matter, end quote, and threaten to kick out students of the class for othering fellow classmates. Thankfully, Iowa State University takes student academic freedom seriously, and following a disciplinary hearing, the university, students, and faculty came to the compromise of correcting the syllabus, and the professor is being provided additional information regarding the First Amendment policies of the university. The threat of professors censoring and suppressing students' free expression in class simply due to their political beliefs is increasing, and only disciplinary hearings can help check back against those gross oversteps of authority. Now, let's consider the topic of hazing. Jude Horace, the president of the North American Interfraternity Conference, told lawmakers that, quote, students report the number one deterrent that will stop hazing, the number one by far, is visible individual public accountability. Holding students and the respective organizations involved in hazing accountable via the due process of disciplinary hearings is only possible at the university level because in cases of hazing that don't reach fatal outcomes, they don't violate city or state law in most places. Disciplinary hearings provide an opportunity to work to address the hazing on campus. You should vote affirmative even if you think that colleges don't discipline every single violation against school policy or if there are flaws at the negative mentions of disciplinary hearings because any successful disciplinary hearing provides significant benefit to both the individual and in creating a safer environment on campus. Thus, we vote or we urge that you vote affirmative. Thank you very much. Is the uh, negative ready to proceed? You're on Thanks mute. I, yeah, I believe you're proceeding uh, quieter than even the normal <laughs> quiet. You are still muted. I think you offended Yali. Yeah. These two seem to be having an issue. Uh, yeah, try to leave and rejoin. Hello, can you hear me? Can yes. You hear me? yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, yes, thank you. All right. Apologies for that. But, okay, let us start. First, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our excellent opponents in this quarter semifinal round, as well as our judges and moderator. Free speech is precious while it's celebrated. Abigail and I negate the resolve that students or faculty members who make other students feel threatened or unsafe should face disciplinary hearings. As an observation, recognize that the resolution asks us to evaluate whether disciplinary hearings should be utilized when a student feels unsafe. The free dictionary defines feel as to be persuaded of something on the basis of intuition, emotion, or other indefinite grounds. Thus, to win this round, the affirmative must prove that the negative consequences of disciplinary hearings are a justified response to intuition, emotion, or other indefinite grounds. With that, our first contention is that school disciplinary hearings replace facts with feelings. First, Disciplinary hearings allow universities to restrict freedom of speech on campus. First Amendment Watch explains that in recent years, many institutions of higher education have failed to uphold the Constitution and free speech has come under attack on campuses across the country. They further that this uniquely occurs in disciplinary hearings as they allow universities to bestow disciplinary power that limits a student's freedom of expression. Such failure is of grave concern because freedom of expression is vital on campuses. 
The very thing we are here to celebrate today would not be possible in a student disciplinary hearing. Second, disciplinary hearings lack evidence and rely on disciplinary committees' subjective intuition. Consider the case of a student at the University of Virginia who is accused of sexual misconduct. His case was heard by a university disciplinary committee and an adjudicator who found the accused responsible under a preponderance of evidence standard. This means that the adjudicator merely has to affirm that the evidence provides that it was more likely than not that this misconduct had occurred. The basis of which is clearly influenced by the disciplinary committee's subjective intuitions. A 2019 report published by Travis Riddle, a postdoctoral scholar at Princeton University, concluded that black students in disciplinary hearings were four times more likely to be suspended than their white counterparts. A study conducted by UCLA found that student suspensions cost the nation between $35 billion and $100 billion annually in top lost tax revenue and increased social expenditures combined. These numbers are difficult to comprehend, but the explanation is very straightforward. Riddle concludes that suspended students are more likely to drop out of college, fall below the poverty line, and ultimately become incarcerated. As a result, each additional dropout costs the nation more than $527,000 in lost tax revenue and healthcare expenditures. We can see that disciplinary suspensions are incredibly damaging, but they are not inevitable. Restorative justice policies are just one example of an alternative mode of discipline that a study by Human Impact Partners concludes can reduce suspensions by 40%. Our second contention is the unspoken cost. First, the costly legal fees for the accused. Andrew Cohen, Cornell Law School graduate, explains that because disciplinary hearings do not start with the presumption of innocence, many students are forced to shell out legal fees to hire an attorney. Cohen furthers that students can expect a starting fee of $5,000 that rises with increased complexity and in hour requirements for the attorney. Samantha Norman and Eliza Putnam are just two of the many students dealing with financial insecurity following an unexpected university disciplinary hearing. The two seniors at Fordham University attempted to report their professor for sexual harassment and abuse, but were sentenced to a disciplinary hearing for proliferating false information. Though they ultimately were found not guilty, the verdict required over $6,000 in legal fees that were only able to be covered due to their viral GoFundMe. Norman and Putnam's story is inspiring, but not every student is so lucky. No student's innocence should be based on whether or not they can go viral and fundraise the cost of a lawyer. Second, the ease of university exploitation. Disciplinary hearing advocates often hail the hearings as a less severe response to student crimes that avoids legal battles. However, that begins with an avoidance of legal action. That avoidance can quickly call for serious legal action when it's wrong. The Foundation for Individual Rights in Education explains in their guide to due process and campus justice that many students take universities to court when they're unsatisfied with the results of their hearing. Due to pressures to avoid wasted time, negative publicity, and the embarrassment of, social, of, of a public record of their unfairness, and the possibility of creating a negative legal precedent for themselves, colleges almost always resort to settling, which incurs large financial burdens for the university. Audrey Conklin reports for Fox News on March 2nd that our very own Arizona State University was forced to settle for $7,040 just this year with a student who felt that the school's disciplinary reaction limited her freedom of expression. While this number may not seem substantial, it is far too easy for students to capitalize off a failed disciplinary system. Now, before we come to a conclusion, let us address some of the affirmative claims in this debate. First, they make an interesting claim regarding the nature of disciplinary hearings. They vary by campuses, locations, and situations. Unlike a criminal or civil proceeding, disciplinary hearings are subjective and not enforced. This means that we cannot say that they are always conducive to things like free speech because every campus is different. Some examples may show them to be in favor of free speech. Others might find themselves silenced completely. We cannot affirm a disciplinary policy when we do not even have a consistent model of what it looks like. Additionally, they reference instances when disciplinary hearings have been helpful, and we agree that they can be. However, none of the examples provided were in response to feeling. 
This debate must focus on whether disciplinary hearings are a justified response to feeling. Even if disciplinary hearings are a justified response to behaviors like hazing or academic dishonesty, they cannot be response to feelings. Ultimately, it is clear. Disciplinary hearings exist to limit speech, increase punishment, and increase university costs. In the context of a response to intuition, emotion, or other indefinite grounds, ask yourself, are they worth it? Thanks, and we were able to hear you, but we were not able to see you. I don't know if you can try to turn your camera on or to reload the page, but. My camera is on. Zane can hey. come in here and verify that right now. There, there we go. We can see you and hear you. Yes, oh, okay. yes, yes. Okay. We, we're, I we're set. Back and on again. I, re I do you. apologize. I, I do oh, apologize. no, no apology necessary. We all understand in the last 13 months, <laughs> we, we have all, dealt with these challenges. So thank you very much. Uh, so now I'm going to turn to the affirmative and actually uh, like to uh, have you react to kind of the end of Mr. Tillman actually mentioned at the beginning and at the end uh, of his opening statement. And this is the concept that is expressed in the prompt of that these disciplinary hearings are appropriate when a student feels threatened or unsafe. If you can please react to that. Yeah, so I think here we're getting too like focused on the word feeling because in these disciplinary hearings, we put students up to the standards and codes of conduct at the universities. So it's not like when you get to these disciplinary hearings, as long as the one person feels like they've been threatened or feels like they've been made to feel unsafe, that they're immediately going to be suspended. Their actions are then going to be compared to the code of conduct of those universities. Even in broader legal systems, you see instances of charges like criminal threatening, where you know there is some subjectivity on determining what is a threatening act versus what is not a threatening act. And therefore, those cases are heard versus the rules, regulations, and laws of that specific institution of justice. And so while students can bring these cases when they feel threatened or unsafe, convictions won't happen and punishments won't be doled out unless there is a direct violation of university code of conduct and university procedures. So now I'll turn to the negative if, if you'd like to react to the affirmative's position. Yeah, I think there's a couple um, sort of issues that we need to clarify, and I'm really glad that Jake posits, you know, there are, there are sort of duality between the notion of disciplinary hearings as a reaction to feeling and disciplinary hearings on their own. We define feel solely because we believe that that is the part of the resolution that we are asked to evaluate, right? The Regents' Cup is here. We are celebrating free speech and public discourse. So now the question becomes, how far does that extend? Do we extend things like disciplinary hearings to people who feel unsafe, or do we preserve them as a means of responding to more evidence-based accusations? And Jake definitely makes an excellent point here, which is that you know, for the most part, we can assume that institutions are self-correcting. If I personally filed a disciplinary hearing against Langston because I said that him having his camera off made me really mad and I felt that, um, you know, there would be some point in which there would be a correction. The disciplinary hearing moderators would likely intervene. But there are a lot of examples involving things like sexual harassment or racially charged statements that are a lot less difficult to just brush off your shoulder. And so when we read you evidence from UCLA that finds that between 35 and $100 billion are spent every year on the subsidizing the cost of students being suspended, it is clear that there is a real issue that we are addressing here, right? There is a genuine problem with the state of disciplinary hearings at universities and the sort of trigger happiness that they have toward students and suspensions. And we think that, you know, regardless of where this issue is occurring, allowing people to then be interrogated on the basis of feeling is only going to exacerbate it. All right. Thank you very much. I'll turn to the affirmative now and, and feel free to ask a question of the negative. Yeah, so I have a question specifically about your framing centrally of basically the people who would get suspended and the social and economic costs put upon them. But why aren't we also considering in that calculus the social and economic costs that these acts that are threatening and unsafe would put upon victims? 
in a system of justice, don't we have to balance the rights of both the victims and the possible perpetrators of, a, of an offense? Yeah, so it's interesting that you choose that wording, right? When people feel threatened, when people feel unsafe, because there's a very big difference between somebody on campus who is in a situation where there is some sort of evidence that they are unsafe and people who feel unsafe. And we don't say this to discount people who feel that something might be about to occur, who people who feel that there is something that is posing a threat to their safety. But we believe that that should be dealt with differently. Namely, disciplinary hearings absent the promise of discipline. So whether it be some sort of restorative justice program, whether it be having a conversation with faculty administrators, I know our school, the one that all four of us attend, offers therapy and counseling for individuals who feel unsafe. We do believe that students who feel unsafe should be taken seriously, just not seriously enough to the point where they could potentially be suspending someone over that intuition, emotion, and definite ground. The negative, if you'd like to ask the question of the affirmative. Yeah, so in your case, you talk a lot about a lot of different procedures that are really potentially incredibly harmful to university students and how, you know, th these actions are justified in, in disciplinary hearings. And I, I'm, I'm wondering, for the case of people who do go to university disciplinary hearings that, that are sort of, they, they do this sort of facetiously or they do this in bad faith, right? If somebody comes up to me and says, or, or who, who looks at me says, you know, I'm Asian, I'm, I, I feel unsafe because of, of the current pandemic. I, I'm wondering whether we can just, like it's justified to go to disciplinary hearings when something like that to me at least would be pretty damaging i would feel that that is that just denies that i am human essentially that you know you believe that i pose a threat to you just because i am asian could you clarify the question asked yeah so my, my question is People bring disciplinary suits based off of intuition that are frivolous. You, you mentioned that these will be dismissed, but doesn't the act of bringing somebody like that to a disciplinary hearing itself have substantial harms? Right. I think there are, it's important to recognize that there are different levels of disciplinary hearings that people have to go through. Certain, of course, this differs upon each university, but a lot of universities first have a filtering phase to see whether or not those things are actually in question of the student code of conduct or the faculty code of ethics. Both of those things must be determined first before, and this filters out a lot of those frivolous claims that you're talking about. But in terms of feeling, I think this is really important that both Langston and Abigail talked about, but I want to put this in the specific context of the affirmative example of hazing. A lot of students don't, like they feel like they're being hazed, but they're not sure if that actually constitutes hazing. With something like hazing where it's not cut and dry, whether or not a certain action, whether being bullied or forcing someone to drink gallons of alcohol throughout a day, there are a lot of ways in which that can be interpreted. So we think that this idea of feeling is something that's important to also encompass within disciplinary hearings. Otherwise, those experiences go unnoticed and untried within disciplinary hearings. So I, I'd like for the uh, negative to, to respond to the assertion by the affirmative that essentially these disciplinary hearings are a good thing for those who've been accused of doing something wrong because they provide due process. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So we definitely sympathize with, you know, due process is something everyone should be entitled to. Absolutely. The, the biggest issue, and this is something that Langston sort of begins to unravel uh, during his opening speech, is that there is not a guarantee of due process, right? The reason that both sides constantly have to interject, depending on the campus, depending on the location, depending on the policy, is because disciplinary hearings do not have a strict operational manual or code. Disciplinary hearings are left to the individual university. And so while due process is undeniably a good thing, 
we are not going to claim that it is a benefit of disciplinary hearings if it is not guaranteed. Even if in a majority of disciplinary hearings we find that due process is somehow afforded, the fact that we have any form of disciplinary policy that does not guarantee due process, but the risks go as far as ending that student's education, we believe is completely unjust. So while there might be some presence of due process, there's no guarantee of it. And that is a very strong reason that we stand in negation. We certainly agree with the sentiment that unjust it's unjust to deprive people of their due process. We think that outside of disciplinary hearings, if you look at the outside worlds of how other criminal cases are tried or civil cases are tried, there are many cases which due process is not actually fully given to the individual. There are cases where it is flawed. There are cases of violations of due process. That does not mean that we put a blanket rejection on those courts because otherwise it would lead to no trying of anything whatsoever. We think that the same is, holds true with disciplinary hearings. Just because there are problems that the negative identifies with disciplinary hearings, just as proof that we should iteratively and continuously try to approve disciplinary hearings to resolve those issues that the negative is talking about. That does not mean that we should get rid of them completely. And I'd love to add on to that, um, if that's okay, that another issue with these is if we go outside of this realm of disciplinary hearings where there are, you know, possible juries of your peers and this, this council of people who are educating this decision and who are trained and brought into this position to educate these hearings, all of a sudden the university administrators now can like unilaterally decide what type of punishment, what type of discipline is good without ever giving a hearing, without ever allowing those individuals who are accused of these violations of being able to respond to those claims. Without these hearings that give the chance for both sides to access the due process in negotiating the claims of both sides of an argument, we think that there would even be worse violations of due process in the negative world. So the negative, this to the affirmative, the negative suggested that in these disciplinary hearings, first of all, there's often a preponderance of the evidence. So, you know, 50% plus one, as opposed to the um, beyond a reasonable doubt standard in a criminal course, in a criminal case, and that also that there's not a presumption of innocence in these disciplinary hearings. How do you uh, respond to that? Well, I think one important thing to think about is first that due process is not a fixed and rigid concept. You know, there are courts in other parts of the world that have different standards, and we still believe that in a preponderance of evidence standard, it is better for the individuals who are accused to be able to respond to those claims and make the argument that a preponderance of evidence would not convict them, would not show that they committed a violation of the student code of conduct, rather than a system in which students do not get noticed, students do not get the chance to respond. Therefore, you know, there can be arguments about which standards necessarily universities should use in disciplinary hearings. However, just because you believe that the preponderance of evidence is not the best standard for due process is not a reason to carte blanche ban every existence of disciplinary hearings on university campus. That is an indication that we should do exactly what Abigail brought up earlier that these disciplinary hearings and that systems of justice, whether it be the United States courts or these disciplinary hearings, attempt to be self-correcting systems, right? That they attempt to improve upon the justice and due process that they're providing. But getting rid of them completely doesn't allow this process of self-correction, of improvement upon the justice or the uh, access to justice in this process. What it does is get rid of it entirely. Reaction from the negative? Like, did you want to? All right, I'll, I'll say something and then LinkedIn will likely add on. But I just wanted to briefly sort of, you know, draw everyone's attention back to the resolution, which is that students or faculty members who make other students feel threatened or unsafe should face disciplinary hearings. Now, if you put the modifier, you know, that we are negating that, that does not mean that we are negating the existence of disciplinary hearings, and it certainly does not suggest that we are calling for their removal. In fact, Langston and I solely take issue with the use of the term feel, right? Because we say that these preponderance of the evidence type 
debates that occur based on feeling can be incredibly damaging. If we look to the most common instances of disciplinary hearings, which would be sexual harassment and assault, preponderance of the evidence is often very, very inadequate to deal with these sorts of accusations, right? There is a reason that we charge sexual assault as a criminal liability in traditional courtrooms. But when we charge it as a preponderance of the evidence, you could theoretically take two people who consensually engaged in sexual activity and find that there is a preponderance of the evidence that they engaged in sexual activity. So we should believe the accuser that it wasn't consensual, right? These sorts of nuance that exist at the criminal level, when we're dealing with these accusations on the university level cease to exist. So our advocacy is not that we should ban disciplinary hearings or that we should terminate them. It's simply, we do not think that they deal with feelings appropriately. We do not think that preponderance of the evidence is a justifiable burden of proof when you're dealing with criminal allegations and criminal allegations that are based on how somebody felt, right? And so, you know, I just think it's really important that we make that clarification. We are not opposed to disciplinary hearings. We are not in favor of universities not having discipline. We just think that the specific phrasing of the resolution, that disciplinary hearings respond to feelings is inappropriate and can lead to a floodgate of violence. I have two key responses to that. First, if you are okay with disciplinary hearings in other situations, you admit that this process can allow for due process in terms of literal violations of the student code of conduct. And we have argued and pointed out to you that while initially these cases may only be about what you say are the feelings of these individuals, in order for them to receive discipline from the university, they must have been found to directly violate the student code of conduct. They're not immediately disciplined just because someone felt that way. There has to be a preponderance of evidence that they specifically violated the code of conduct outlined by that university. But second, I want to like slightly add a little bit of nuance to something you said with a preponderance of evidence. You said that then, you know, if there's a preponderance of evidence that those two individuals engaged in sexual activity, then that means that that person would be, you know, convicted or subject to discipline. But that's not exactly the case. If there's a preponderance of evidence that they assaulted someone sexually, then they would be subject to discipline in these cases. So there are, there are two facets here. And the, the difficulty with what disciplinary hearings traditionally deal with is that we rely a lot on testimony, right? When we deal with things like sexual assault, consent is not something that can be shown on a piece of paper. And so our criticism is that disciplinary hearings exercise a level of subjectivity. They are inconsistent, right? Across different campuses, they all have different policies. There's no universal oversight, which means that if someone is falsely convicted, what happens next? We don't think about the consequences of false convictions because they're not criminal sentences. They're suspensions, right? But suspensions are just as damaging because we don't talk about them. Suspensions have the potential to end someone's education on the basis of feeling or intuition and preponderance of evidence. We can talk about more examples in our rebuttal, but there are undeniably examples of when disciplinary hearings have used physical evidence plus a witness's testimony to convict someone. And that is why suspensions are so, so common. Now, one more point that I would like to clarify, and then I think Langston probably has a couple questions, is while we have this sort of discourse about disciplinary hearings and, you know, they're okay in other instances, that is not our advocacy. We are not pro-disciplinary hearings. But this is not an absolutist position. We are not required to say that disciplinary hearings are all good or all bad. We, I think both sides agree that disciplinary hearings have a lot of issues. But in the context of affirming the resolution, you are affirming them as they are, right? Because if, if you could do anything else, we could come up and affirm and say that we love disciplinary hearings and also we're going to give $100 to everybody who is in a disciplinary hearing for their participation, right? If we start adding what might happen in the future, it changes the nature of this debate. We can no longer debate evidence. So we need to debate disciplinary hearings as they exist currently. You all are affirming that that is a justified response to feeling and Langston and I are negating. Neither of us need to say they're all good or all bad. We just need to debate whether or not they are a justified response to this stimulus. 
Do, do we have a response from the affirmative? And then Mr. Tillman, I'll allow you to ask a question. Yeah, I guess my response is really a question to Abigail specifically about the, so you talked in that response basically about how there is this issue with bias. There's this issue with feelings coming in on these sexually sexual assault cases. And therefore that if these are truly criminal proceedings that they should go to criminal courts. But even in criminal courts, you know, a jury of your peers can have bias, can't it? And like sexual assault cases heard in criminal trials are also based predominantly on testimony of individuals involved. So like no system of justice that is trying to explore these really complex issues is going to be perfect. So what makes disciplinary hearings so much worse than these instances in criminal trials that also rely on possibly biased, you know, educators of decision making on, you know, possibly biased testimony? Well, first of all, I think we have to draw a distinction here between courts, criminal courts, civil courts, and disciplinary hearings. Right. We understand that in a lot of cases, there is bias in, in the jury, but in, in a lot of these cases that we're talking about, like sexual assaults, in actual criminal courts cases, their burden of proof is much, much higher. Right. When we're talking about something at a university level, we're only talking about preponderance of evidence. And we've already demonstrated to you that this can lead to incredibly biased uh, conclusions. Right. So. It, it, it seems that you're, you're sort of conflating them as if they have a similar bias and a similar burden of proof, which is not the case. If I may respond, I think it's important to understand and recognize why it is that universities and colleges have different levels of due process. As we said in our fire evidence, there are three things that they look to. The first is the private interests impacted by the disciplinary hearing, which is the individual being accused and the individual who is the victim. Then there is the risk of erroneous deprivation of such interests. And in the context of universities and colleges, both teams agree that that is things like uh, expulsion, uh, suspension, probation, et cetera. Then they look at the school's interests, including the functioning of the educational system, and then also the fiscal and administrative burden. In each of these three fa factors, they differ between each university for a reason, and they lead to different standards of evidence being required. That is why it differs between the university and out in the criminal courts because of specific, specifically in the context of sexual assault, like the negative is focusing on, those the implications of being found guilty in a university disciplinary hearing are different than they are if you were found guilty within a criminal court, ranging from being locked up and go to jail for an extended amount of time, as opposed to being suspended. We agree that being suspended and expo uh, uh, being expelled are huge impacts, but they don't come anywhere close to those that happen in criminal courts, resulting in the differences in due process and the standards of evidence required. Okay, Mr. Tillman, I'm going to let you ask the last question and we'll, of course, have the affirmative respond to it. So you talk about, for instance, hazing when people are not sure whether something actually is hazing or not. But then you talk about how people will be forced to drink gallons of alcohol. I. I, first of all, I don't think that that has much to do with feeling when you are literally being sort of alcohol is being gulped down your throat. Uh, I, I read a case on the state press a few weeks ago about one of these cases, and it was it was horrific. But I don't think that's exactly what we're debating here. And so, oh, I, I think you do make the case that hazing can be solved by public accountability. I, I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I cut out for a bit. I, I'm not entirely sure if that's the case. But I, I just don't think that is the case because, for instance, a lot of Greek life fraternities, they sort of feed off this sort of process that is potentially incredibly damaging to students. Wait, what was the question with that? I'm sorry, Lance. Yes. I think I think I can summarize because Langston had messaged me the question he was intending me to or he was intending to ask. Uh, functionally, the point is when we're talking about issues like hazing, which are solved by public accountability, disciplinary hearings happen in the shadows. They're addressed privately. 
disciplinary hearing results cannot be disclosed on campus. So if these issues are solved by public accountability, why would private disciplinary hearings be the answer? We think that the accountability that occurs for hazing is indeed public. When a fraternity is not allowed on campus any longer, that is a public act of consequence. Those individuals are no longer able to be a part of the university or other punishments include kicking the individual out of a fraternity. When that person is out of the fraternity, they see that disciplinary hearings had a specific consequence. Also, in the, uh, with what Langston talked about initially, I don't think it's possible to separate feeling like you're being threatened and actually being threatened. When you are actually threatened, you are both feeling like you were threatened and you are actually threatened. There is no way to separate those two. And then in the context of hazing, sure, there's the example of drinking gallons of alcohol and being forced to do so. Sure, that seems a little bit more explicit of being hazing but for a lot of college students, they don't know what that bright line is. They don't know whether they should speak out or to go to a disciplinary hearing or seek uh, uh, some type of justice for what they've occurred because they don't know what that is. Even though they feel like they've been hazed, they don't know how to, uh, they don't know what the bright line is for what being hazed is. That's why disciplinary hearings allow for those discussions to occur to further inform students to fix this in the future. All right, well, that, that was an excellent dialogue back and forth, a great example of civil discourse. And with that, now we will move to the closing statements for the affirmative, Mr. Dean. All right, everyone ready? All right, well, I just wanna first thank my opponents for a truly, truly interesting debate that has been very civil and thank my judges once again. And I think that today's debate really comes down to first, the issue of due process. Second, the issue of whether or not passing today's resolution upholds a safe learning environment. And three, and finally, whether or not there is too much subjectivity in these disciplinary hearings for the word feeling to be used in the resolution. So let's get into it. First, in terms of due process, I want to reiterate an argument that Zane made during the questioning period, as well as in his opening speech that first, university disciplinary hearings necessitate the examination of standards of due process for the private interest impacted, the risk of erroneous deprivation of such interest, and the school's interest, including the functions involved, both fiscal and administrative. So when the negative case comes up here and tells you there's a number of due process issues, and the thing that they really focus on is this preponderance of evidence standard, Zane makes a fantastic point that we have to also consider what the deprivation of such interests are in these cases. It's not the same thing as a criminal trial and it's not beyond an unreasonable doubt because the consequences and harms of these hearings are very different from criminal proceedings. But more than that, we argue that this is a self-correcting process, that we need these systems of justice, these institutions of justice, and we need to continue to work on them to ensure that proper notice, representation, equal access occurs in these settings. You know, Langston and Abigail, you are right. There will be some false convictions, both in disciplinary hearings and in the broader judicial system and in pretty much every sort of justice deliberation that will go on for all of humanity. I mean, humans aren't perfect. Juries aren't perfect. And administrative councils aren't perfect either. But we need a system to ensure that people can actually respond to the charges levied against them on a campus, be able to get notice and be able to represent their views of why they don't believe that they have met the standard of a preponderance of evidence. Without it, we lose due process and we lose access to justice on our campuses. But second, we must affirm today's re resolution because we need to uphold a safe environment. Turn back to our examples that we brought up under the ASU Code of Conduct. There's a number of examples here that don't rise to the level of a criminal trial like a professor politically discriminating against a student for their beliefs or their writings, or the instances of hazing where people feel threatened. Those cases can't go to criminal trials, but they definitely explain instances where individuals, whether they be faculty or students, have violated the student code of conduct on campus. We must ensure that individuals who are victims of these acts have proper recourse on campus and disciplinary hearings are that solution. But third, and finally, let's come to the important discussion of subjectivity in these cases. I will repeat something, I forget which affirmative speaker said it, that their entire reason 
for being annoyed with disciplinary hearings or taking issue with disciplinary hearings in this case is the word feel in this resolution, that they are worried that the word feel in this resolution opens up these disciplinary hearings to far too much subjectivity. But let me repeat one of the first things that we talk about in our case and one of the first things that I mentioned in question, and that's that sure, there are instances where someone may, you know, I guess, feel that they've been threatened, but it doesn't reach the level of an issue in code of conduct. However, as Zane explains, that's why there's multiple layers. There is a filtering process to ensure that these frivolous cases don't make it past an initial review. But even if they do, what we are showing you today is that while there might be a feeling that brought the complaint to the disciplinary hearing, disciplinary hearings are educated and decided based on an explicit student code of conduct. It's not just an immediate guilty verdict if someone says they feel unsafe or threatened. There is a deliberative process. There is a process of trying to determine the validity of these claims under due process. And if you say that just because there is some possibility for bias on these disciplinary hearings or in the jury of their peers, then you would have to deny each and every institution of justice in our society. Zane and I are not saying that disciplinary hearings are perfect and that there's never been any issues with them. But what we are saying is they are important vehicles for students to bring complaints and issues with professors and other students' code of conduct and that they must be protected by affirming today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, Ms. Spencer. When I returned from winter break my senior year of high school, I was informed that a member of my debate team had developed an affection for me, an affection that was somewhat dangerous in nature and justified him sending some really concerning messages to other people on my team. So I took action. I went to my school and told them exactly what was happening. I conveyed the fear I was experiencing and I told them that I was being stalked. I wasn't. People had started a rumor to see if they could get me to report it. And I did. I found this out one year later, about a month before my graduation ceremony. Something that plagued my high school experience still haunts me to this day, which is why despite all of the confusion and clarifications that need to occur in this debate, I am going to explain it to you. Because disciplinary hearings are undeniably a force against justice and free speech. And we have to recognize that because we are here today to celebrate free speech, not to win debate rounds. And if we are here merely to make points that are better for our side, we will never achieve that justice and we will never protect our liberties. So with that, let's break down some of the claims of why disciplinary hearings are good. Initially, that they secure due process. As we have said time and time again, this is not guaranteed. Disciplinary hearings can provide due process. Many things can provide due process, but that doesn't mean it is a guarantee. There is a difference between having constitutionally guaranteed freedom of speech and being able to speak freely except when we disagree with you. In this instance, we believe that we should only affirm a method of discipline that swears and ensures that there will be due process because I got someone suspended for doing nothing and that haunts me. And I really wish that I was part of a system that guaranteed that person had due process and an investigation and didn't just go off of the fear in my voice and the way I felt when I was informed of this. But further, they say that we need some form of system to ensure safety on campus. We absolutely do, but it is not this one. Langston and I bring you countless examples of alternatives from restorative justice to other modes of discipline that don't end with suspension. All of these alternatives must be available for lower level crimes. We can't simply rely on some institutions to distinguish when crimes are low or high level and to act accordingly. Because this subjectivity that the affirmative tries to paint as just a few bad apples, they don't finish the statement. It spoils the bunch. Disciplinary hearings with some issues mean that disciplinary hearings cannot be trusted. If we are allowing 30 to $100 billion worth of suspensions to occur every year as a result of disciplinary hearings, there is a clear issue, not just one that becomes a potential for lack of due process, but one that exposes a necessity for change. But further, let's analyze this argument about subjectivity. 
Subjectivity is absolutely inevitable. And regardless of who I went to, there would be subjectivity in a response. However, when we are dealing with subjectivity, it is important that we adjust the consequences accordingly. For the pro speakers to suggest that disciplinary hearings are less severe in their consequences and thus justify subjectivity is blatantly untrue as we give you the unspoken cost of disciplinary hearings. Suspensions alter people's lives. Disciplinary hearings that interrogate both sides alter people's lives. I was changed by a disciplinary hearing where I wasn't even the one punished. Instead of having access to therapy or counseling or restorative justice, we have a system that prioritizes freedom of speech without the free part. Disciplinary hearings emphasize communicating both sides, but not in a way that ensures due process, and certainly not in a way that is objective. But we justify this as people will only be suspended. People will be suspended in a way that changes their entire lives. We give you the example of two girls who were brought to a disciplinary hearing on an allegation with no evidence that they were being unprofessional with a staff member. This cost them $6,000 in legal fees because their university didn't have a vetting process. Because at their university, disciplinary hearings were not in favor of their free speech, but simply producing an outcome. Feelings are important. And I understand the fear that would cause someone to initiate a disciplinary hearing, but they are not the solution. When people feel safe or unthreatened, we have so many alternative ways of dealing with it. Do not challenge free speech and do not question due process as an unequivocal, undeniable right. And it is because we believe that it is always a right to due process. We negate. Well, thank you very much. That was an excellent, excellent round. Uh, I uh, All I can say is that I'm very happy to, that I'm the moderator and I don't have to pick a winner here because just exceptional. And uh, again, knowing the vision of those who, who brought the Regions Cup into being, I think this round really lived up to that. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much to the judges for your attentiveness and again, uh, your willingness to make this very tough decision. So thanks so much and, and good luck to both teams. Thank you so much, especially Jake Zane. It's been an yeah. honor practicing with y'all all, all yeah, season yeah. and culminating in this debate. It was great.